What's going on everyone? So welcome to my latest video. This is my top 10 films that have always been perfect. Part two. So this is a video I was very much so looking forward to do because part one I had so much fun filming and at the same time it seemed like there's a pretty good reception from my viewers. So it was a win-win in my book to do a part two. It wasn't easy to do truthfully because although if you go in my letterbox you will see that I've had around 100 or so films that I've looked at as five to five. Of those, I would say only like 29, 30 of those were immediate five to five stars. And then from the first viewing to now that I look at as five to five. Many films, it takes me quite a bit of rewatches for it to register and for it to click that yes, this is a five to five in my book. Like a great example would be The Tree of Life. One of my all-time favorite films. I look at it as a masterpiece, but I didn't always look at it like that. In fact, it was the opposite end of the spectrum. The first time I saw The Tree of Life, I actually hated it. Um, but I couldn't get it out of my head, so I decided to rewatch it. And then it went from a half a star to like, I think a three and a half. Then I rewatched it again, and I gave it a four, and then it kept going up till finally it being a five out of five. So that film, whilst I love it and I think it's a masterpiece now, it's not a film that would register as a film that has always been perfect because in my eyes at the time when I first saw it, it wasn't. So the end of the spectrum though of that is that the film like Midsummer I first saw in 2019, I thought it was a masterpiece in theaters, both times that I saw it in theaters. It wasn't until I picked it up on Blu-ray and I saw it a third time where I was like, yeah, this is a really good film, but I then brought the rating down to a four and a half. So that is no longer a film that's always been perfect because it went down. So I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from that these 10 films that I'm going to be talking about are films that have always, from the first time I saw them to as of the filming of this video in November 2023, been perfect in my eyes. They might not be in your eyes, and that's completely fine. In fact, I'm looking forward to seeing your guys' top 10 films that have always been perfect in the comment section down below because everyone's is going to be different, and that's what's great about film being an art form. It's subjective, so it's exciting. Um, also, I would just say this, part one of this video, um, top 10 films that have always been perfect, that one spanned, I believe it was like 2007 to the end of 2013. This video is going to be quite different where it's going to be, um, my number one is going to be the beginning of, of 2014 and then my number 10 is going to be the, the end of 2015 november 2015 but what's going to happen is i'm going to go from 10 to 1 with 1 being the one that's always been perfect um for the longest period of time in terms of this particular video so hopefully i explained that well if you guys need a bit more context um just ask away in the comment section down below but guys enough exposition let's kick things off guys with my number 10 which is spotlight so Spotlight is the 2015 Academy Award Best Picture winner, and deservingly so. It is a masterpiece. I absolutely love the journalism in this film, the dialogue, the character development, the writing is so strong. I love the acting. Everything about this film works. Howard Shore's score, the drab cinematography, I think really works well with the tone that the directing is trying to establish. Is this a film that's comfortable to watch? Mm, for many people, no. But it is something that I do think is a necessity to watch at least once because it is covering a lot, a lot of important themes. And I do think that it handles them in very interesting ways. I think that in particular, the ending scene works really, really well. Um, so again, not necessarily a film that I can see many people wanting to revisit, but I do think it should be watched at least once. For me, I'll rewatch it anytime. If someone were to right now say, Chad, you want to rewatch Spotlight? I'll say, Heck yeah. Let's put it on right now. I love this film and it looks really, really good on Blu-ray. And uh, yeah, watch Spotlight if you haven't done so already. And that's why it's my number 10. Next up, my number nine. Uh, this film I also saw in November of 2015, which is when I saw Spotlight in theaters for the first time. Um, this film, as soon as I watched it, I was like, this is my favorite action film of all time. And my number nine is The Raid 2. So, like I mentioned, uh, when I first saw this in November 2015, I loved it so much that I immediately picked up the score. Um, and I gotta say, any time that I am late for work, you best believe that I am putting on the score for The Raid 2 because it is heart pumping. It is enthralling. And that's just the film as a whole. The stunt work, the acting, the action scenes, they're all so, so good. There's such an intensity to this film and propulsive nature that works really well. And I also really appreciate how this film has like the character development of like, say, The Departed or like Casino, but it also has the intense visceral action of I would say even more so than like the John Wick films. It is way more intense than those films and I'm saying that as someone that does like the John Wick films. This film is even more intense and it brings such a visceral reaction every time that I watch it in the best of ways. This film might not be for everyone, but if you like action films that are hard hitting, definitely watch this. This is my favorite action film, hands down, 
and it is a great, great film, just in general. And um, yeah, that's why it's my number nine. Next up, my number eight, um, this film I saw several times in May of 2015 when it was in theaters, and that is Mad Max Fury Road. So Mad Max Fury Road also happens to be one of my favorite action films. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, yeah, this... This is a game changer. I absolutely love the visual storytelling of this film, how there was so much world building just through the visuals, just through the directing, the acting. It is an impressive, impressive feat of a film. There are some people I've heard that say there is no story. I disagree. I think there is plenty of story. You just got to actually, you know, use your eyes. Um, and to be honest with you, on the audio front of things, it's a pretty impressive film. I mean, the sound mixing is glorious. The um, score by John XL is just outstanding. This is another score similar to The Raid 2 that is just so heart pumping that you can't help but be enthralled by this film. I also think it's one of the best paced action films and just one of the best films of 2015 in general. And films in general. This is one of my favorite films of all time, and it's a film that, similar to The Raid 2, I just, I can't get enough of. I can watch this at any point in time. I love Mad Max Fury Road. If you've been sleeping on this film for some reason and you're a fan of action films, what are you doing? Watch Mad Max Fury Road. It is that great. And, um, yeah, that's why it's my number eight. Next up, my number seven. Um, this was a film I saw in March of 2015 uh, for the first time, and that is Requiem for a Dream. So yeah, this is a film that it's, uh, I believe it's only 100, 102 minutes. 102 minutes, the uh, unrated like director's cut. It is 102 minutes of just misery, but it's incredibly well done misery. I mean, this is a film that it handles the topics of drug abuse, addiction so, so well. I mean, this is also a film that is heartbreaking on so many levels. Ellen Burson's character in particular what a character arc and what a performance by Ella Burson. She did such a great job. She was robbed of an Oscar. I think she should have won the Oscar. I'm glad she was nominated, but she should have won. She gives such a powerful performance. Of course, the score is memorable. Of course, the cinematography, um, you know, mixed with that editing style of like hip hop music videos works really well. It's a film that's very fast paced. It's not going to be for everyone. In fact, many people that can't handle grim films, I, I can see them not wanting to watch this film. And I get that. But this is a film that's similar to Spotlight. It is handling, you know, topics that aren't necessarily easy to discuss. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't be viewed at least one time, I think personally. But at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, I get why someone might not necessarily want to. But I do think that this is a masterpiece. And yeah, that is why it's my number seven. Next up, my number six. Um, this is a film that I saw December, the end of December of 2014. And that is uh, my favorite animated film, Fantastic Mr. Fox. This is the film that when I saw it, I immediately said to myself, I think I like claymation. I think claymation might actually be my favorite form of animation. And um, to this day, I still stand by that. I've watched Fantastic Mr. Fox so many times, but it never gets old. I love everything about this film. Alexander Desplat's score, the claymation, the voice acting, the humor, the pacing. Everything works about this film. Every single category. Filmmaking, entertainment value, rewatchability value, it all works on so many different levels. And in true Wes Anderson fashion, he combines many different genres seamlessly. This is a perfect film. It is a film that I can't wait to show my kids in the future. I really can't because there are many times that I've heard kids watch films many, many times. And that many times parents get tired of them. This is a film that if my kid loves Fantastic Mr. Fox, I will have no problem watching it 60 times in a month. I kid you not. And that's why I condensed Mr. Fox. It is my number six. And next up, we have my number five, which is Some Like It Hot. So Some Like It Hot is a film I saw in October of 2014, and I immediately was taken aback at just, just how great it was. And this was honestly also the film that when I saw it, I immediately decided to start thinking about Marilyn Monroe as an actress more seriously because prior to this growing up I heard she wasn't a good actress but this was the first time I actually 
saw her in a film, and she was amazing. I thought she was fantastic with her performance. More importantly, though, it was then something that, again, I just grew such an appreciation for her as an actress, and also comedic timing. And that's just it. This film it works so well in terms of the comedy, but it also has such a great story, which is something that I think also isn't really balanced as well a lot of times in comedies, but this film balances it so well. The performances are great, as I mentioned, Marilyn Monroe, but more importantly, let's talk about Tony Curtis and Jack Lemons. They have also great comedic timing, and I think that this film also looks great. Love the black and white cinematography. I know that they could have shot it in color, but they decided to shoot it in black and white. And I'm so glad that they did, because I do think that it gives a timeless feel to it. Dialogue works really well, and it has one of the funniest endings of all time. I would highly recommend watch Some Like It Hot if you've been sleeping on it, because it is a classic for a reason. It is one of my favorite films of all time, and yeah, it's always been perfect in my eyes. That's why it's my number five. So Some Like It Hot I saw at the end of October. Uh, at the beginning of October, I saw in theaters a film that really changed to me as a viewer, um, and that is my number five, which is, I mean, my number four, which is Gone Girl. Gone Girl is an incredible film. It is in my top five of all time right now. This is a film that I just, I can't explain really how angry this film made me when I first saw it, in a good way. Like, it's the type of thing where it gave me such a visceral reaction that I always hear people talk about, like, oh, this film did this to me, or this film did this to me, but it never, I don't think, happened to me until I saw this film. And this is a film that, upon multiple viewings, I still get, like, a reaction, but more of, like, a, oh, wow, like, this is interesting. Because at the time, I was looking at it more of, like, a... um. I didn't really have more of like a gray um, microscope, if you will. This was a uh, Chad watching it at the time in more of like a black and white kind of uh, lens. And that's something that, again, we all learn as viewers over the course of time. I'm glad that now I have the lens that I do because watching it now, I see all the nuances, not only of the performances, but of the themes, the messages, the characters, and with what they're going through. But more importantly, it's also a film that is incredible in terms of the filmmaking. The visual effects are seamless. I know what you guys are thinking. Wait a minute. It's a drama and there's visual effects. Yeah, David Fincher uses a lot of visual effects, but he uses them in a way that is more of like background. So you don't really notice it because it's not really in the foreground. And that's something that I really appreciate because I wouldn't have thought until it got brought to my attention years back, I would not have thought that David Fincher's films were heavy in visual effects other than The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. But his films have such a heavy dosage of it, but we don't notice and care about them because it's something that is just so seamless. But I wanted to bring it to people's attention because of just how great it is because of that. Um, the other thing is Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, they have a great, great score. I loved it. And I think the cinematography is just outstanding. Performances are off the chart and it has one of the best endings, in my opinion, of all time. Gone Girl is a film that if you've been sleeping on, again, please watch it. I think this film works so well. It is a great drama. It is a great neo-noir. It is a great mystery. It works on so many different genres. And I think that's what gives it such a wide appeal. Please watch Gone Girl if you haven't already. And um, yeah, that's why it's my number four. Next up, my uh, my number three. This is another 2014 film that I uh, that I saw, and it was immediately a five out of five. And um, holy cow, this film I saw for the first time on my birthday of 2014, and it was a great first film to watch as an adult. My number three is The Grand Budapest Hotel. Yeah, I love this film. If you ask any of my friends, I can't I can't stop talking about this film enough. I think it works so so well. Everything about it. Similar to Fantastic Mr. Fox, it builds on so many different genres. Like Wes Anderson has so many different genres, but they all work seamlessly. Alexander Desplat's score is great. Uh, Ralph Fiennes, beautiful, beautiful performances. Mr. Gustav is great. Zero. There's so many great characters. Of course, the cast has so many cast members that are incredible. It's just a film that, again, it works so well. And every single shot works as a painting. It is so delicate. It looks... So beautiful. This is a film that the quirky nature of it might not work to everyone, but if you are someone that is more of an adventurous film goer that can appreciate quirky humor, I would, let me let me take it back, quirky dark humor, because it does get pretty dark sometimes, but it works so well, at least to my sensibilities of humor. So again, not for everyone, but I would highly advise that if you are an adventurous film goer that likes quirky humor, watch The Grand Budapest Hotel. It is fantastic and yeah, in the nine years that I've been watching it, every time I watch it, hits, and it's a five out of five. 
So yeah, uh, Grand Budapest Hotel is my number three. Next up, my number two. This is a film that, holy cow. <laughs> this film, man. Uh, so my number two is Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, I, holy cow. I'll never forget watching this film. I, I watched it in like February of 2014. And when I saw it, it was at like, I think 1, 2 a.m., which is honestly a perfect first viewing for this film because there's one sequence in particular that is actually terrifying. Like the film itself is more fantasy. It's fantasy war, but there's one sequence that is horrifying. And to this day, I'm like, oh man, that's hard to watch. But watching it at 1 to 2 a.m., beautiful. This is a film that honestly might be my favorite fantasy film. And I'm saying that as someone that loves Lord of the Rings. I think this film works so, so well. It is basically a grown-up fairy tale. Like it's a film that you know, has that storybook feel to it, but it also has the gritty nature of a war film and the more uh, dark side of human nature displayed on screen. Like, the the villain the villain of this film very much so reminds me of Amon Goth of Schindler's List. Yeah, he's that terrifying, and he's that, like, just horrific with the things that he does. So it's not a film that might not necessarily work for everyone's sensibilities, but it is a film that works to mine. Again, I think something that, now that I'm actually talking about all these films with this video that I'm noticing is that a lot of these films work within multiple genres. And I think that that's something that just goes to show that when you have multiple genres, as long as you do every genre well, you can make something that works so well. And I think that Pan's Labyrinth is one of those films. It just is a film that works on every single level. There's not a thing I would change about this film. It is Del Toro's masterpiece. And um, yeah, box one number two. Next up, my number one, this one I saw, I believe it was a couple weeks um, prior to Pan's Labyrinth. So I technically did see this, my number one, uh, in February 2014. But uh, my number one is The Godfather, part two. So I know what you guys are thinking. If you watched my part one video, I did have The Godfather, part one, as top 10 films that have always been perfect. And what's odd about it, and I, for the life of me, don't really know why I waited so long um, to watch part two. Because when I watched part one, it was May of 2013. I didn't watch part two until February 2014. Um, it might have been, just looking back, it might have just been that um, finding three and a half hours was kind of difficult, maybe. I don't know. Regardless, though, watching The Godfather part two, I immediately was just wowed at how great it was. And just how... It's a prequel and a sequel, and it works on both levels. It is a film that it warrants it being a prequel, but it also warrants it being a sequel. And I admire that. I really do. But I also think that it really enriches the themes and messages of the first one, whilst at the same time building its own legacy. And that's, I think, something that really is incredible. And what's more important is that the family dynamics and the family drama in particular is something that I think now at this point in my life, I'm able to really relate to and really able to latch on to and just really build an emotional resonance. Like, I'm not gonna lie, towards the end, there's one in particular scene that's like a flashback and it almost brought me to tears. Not because of just like, you know, oh, these characters are happy. It's because this is something that it was the last time that they were happy and that there's particular events that happened in one that from then onwards, had these characters never get to experience that happiness, that joy. And I think that that was something that just hit me even harder the most recent time that I watched it. But considering that this film has been in my life for almost a decade, and each time that I watch it, I get something from it, that's something that is just beautiful. That's what I love about film. And The Godfather Part Two, it is a masterpiece. I love it. I highly recommend Part 1 and 2. Yeah, I know I technically own Part 3, but it's not perfect. By a long shot. But yeah, guys, that is my top 10 films that have always been perfect, part two. Um, I might be doing a part three, but as of the filming of this video, I only have, from what I looked back, looked back at with my films and everything that I've watched, as of the filming of this video, I've only seen nine other films that have always been perfect. So uh, maybe sometime soon I'll be watching a ten, uh, like I'll, I'll, another film that's five to five, and I can sneak that in as a, hey, it's always been five to five, even though it was the first time viewing. 
But regardless, um, I want to hear your guys' thoughts on uh, your top 10 films that have always been perfect. I really am. I'm curious because I know, again, as I mentioned earlier, film is subjective. So I want to hear your guys' top 10 films that have always been perfect. And as always, guys, thank you very much for watching my part two of top 10 films that have always been perfect. And I always look forward to hearing your guys' thoughts. And don't forget the subscription, notification bell, follow me down in the letterbox, and I will get you guys later.